Chapter Eight of the Forgotten Planet by Murray Leinster. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A flight continues. Burl kept his people alive until darkness fell. He assigned watchers for each direction, and when flight was necessary, the adults helped the children to avoid the red dust. Four times they changed direction after shrill voiced warnings. When night settled over the plain, they were forced to come to a halt. But the puffballs were designed to burst by day. Stumbled into, they could split at any time, and the humans did hear some few of the tearing noises that denoted a spore spout in the darkness. But after slow nightly rain began, they heard no more. Burl led his people into the plain of red puffballs as soon as the rain had lasted long enough to wash down the red haze still hanging in the air and turn the fallen spores to mud. It was an enterprise of such absolute desperation that very likely no civilized man would have tried it. There were no stars for guidance, no compasses to show the way. There were no lights to enable them to dodge the deadly things they strove to escape, and there were no possibility of their keeping a straight course in the darkness. They had to trust to luck in perhaps the longest long shot that humans ever accepted as a gamble. Quaintly, they used the long antenna of a dead flying beetle as sense organs for themselves. They entered the red plain in a long single file, Burl leading the way, with one of the two feathery whips extended before him. Saya helped to check on what lay in the darkness ahead, but made sure not to leave his side. Others trailed behind, hand in hand. Progress was slow. The sky was utter blackness, of course, but nowhere in the lowlands is there an absolute black. Where fox fire doesn't burn without consuming, there are mushrooms with glows of their own. Rust sometimes shone faintly. Naturally, there were no fireflies or glowworms of any sort, but neither were there any living things to hunt the tiny tribe as it moved half blindly in single file through the plain of red puffballs. Within half an hour, even, Burl did not believe he had kept to his original line. An hour later, they realized despairingly that they were marching helplessly through puffballs which would make the air unbreathable at dawn. But they marched on. Once they smelled the rank odor of cabbages. They followed the scent and came upon them, glowing palely with parasitic molds on their leaves. And there were living things here, huge caterpillars eating and eating, even in the dark, against the time of metamorphosis. Burl could have cried out infuriatedly at them because they were, so he assumed, immune to the death of the red dust. But the red dust was all about, and the smell of cabbages was not the smell of life. It could have been, of course. Caterpillars breathe like all insects at every stage of their development, but furry caterpillars breathe through openings which are covered with matted fur. Here that matted fur acted to filter the air. The eggs of the caterpillars had been laid before the puffballs were ready to burst. The time of spore-bearing would be over before the grubs were butterflies or moths. These creatures were safe against all enemies, even men. Men groped and blundered in the darkness simply because they did not think to take fur garments they wore and hold them to their noses to serve as gas masks or air filters. The time for that would come, but not yet. With the docility of despair, Burl's tribe followed him through all the night. When the sky began to pale in the east, they numbly resigned themselves to death, but still they followed. And in the very early gray light, when only the very ripest of the red puffballs spouted toward a still dark sky, Burl looked harassedly about him and could have groaned. He was in a little circular clearing, the deadly red things all about him. There was not yet light enough 
for colors to appear. There was merely a vast stillness everywhere, and a mocking hint of the hot and peppery scent of death dust now turned to mud all about him. Burl dropped in bitter discouragement. Soon the misty dust clouds would begin to move about. The reddish haze would form above all this space. Then, quite suddenly, he lifted his head and whooped. He had heard the sound of running water. His followers looked at him with dawning hope. Without a word to them, Burl began to run. They followed hastily and quickened their pace when his voice came back in a shout of triumph. In a moment, they had emerged from the tangle of fungus growths to stand upon the banks of a wide river, the same river whose gleam Burl had seen the day before from the farther side of the red puffball plain. Once before, Burl had floated down a river upon a mushroom raft. That journey had been involuntary. He had been carried far from his tribe and Saya, his heart filled with desolation. But now he viewed the swiftly running current with delight. He cast his eyes up and down the bank. Here and there it rose in a low bluff and thick shelf fungi stretched out above the water. They were adaptations of the fungi that had once grown on trees and now fed upon the incredibly nourishing earth banks formed of dead growing things. Burl was busy in an instant, stabbing the relatively hard growths with his spear and striving to wrench them free. The tribesmen stared blankly, but at a snapped order they imitated him. Soon, Two dozen masses of firm light fungus lay upon the shore. Burl began to explain what they were for, but Dor remonstrated. They were afraid to part from him. If they might embark on the same fungus raft, it would be a different matter. Old Tama scolded him shrilly at the thought of separation. John trembled at the mere idea. Burl cast an apprehensive glance at the sky. Day was rapidly approaching. Soon, the red puffballs would burst and shoot their dust clouds into the air. There was no time to make stipulations. Then, Saya spoke softly. Burl made the suggested great sacrifice. He took the gorgeous velvet coat of Mothwing from his shoulder and tore it into a dozen long, irregular pieces along the lines of the sinews reinforcing it. He planted his spear upright in the largest raft, fastening the other cranky craft to it with the improvised lines. In a matter of minutes, the small flotilla of rafts bobbed in the stream. One by one, Burl settled the folk upon them with stern commands about movement. Then he shoved them out from the bank. The collection of uneasy floating things moved slowly out from shore to where the current caught them. Burl and Saya sat on the same section of fungus. The other, trustful but frightened tribespeople, clustered timorously about. As they began to move between the mushroom-lined banks of the river, and as the mist of nighttime lifted from its surface, columns of red dust spurred it sullenly upward on the plain. In the light of dawn, the deadly red haze was forming once more over the puffball plain. By that time, however, the unstable rafts were speeding down the river, bobbing and whirling in the stream, with wide-eyed people as their passengers gazing in wonderment at the shores. Five miles downstream, the red growths became less numerous, and other forms of fungus took their places. Molds and rusts covered the ground as grass did on more favored planets. Toadstools showed their creamy, rounded heads, and there were malformed things with swollen trunks and branches mocking the trees that were never seen in these lowlands. Once the tribesmen saw the grisly bulk of a hunting spider outlined on the river bank. All through the long day they rode the current, while the insect life that had been absent in the neighborhood of the Death Plain became abundant again. 
Bees once more droned overhead, and wasps and dragonflies. Four-inch mosquitoes appeared to be driven off with blows. Glittering beetles made droning or booming noises as they flew. Flies of every imaginable metallic hue flew about. Huge butterflies danced above the steaming land and running river in seeming ecstasy at simply being alive. All the thousand and one forms of insect life flew and crawled and swam and dived where the people of the rafts could see them. Water beetles came lazily to the surface to snap at other insects on the surface. The shell-covered boats of caddisflies floated in the eddies and backwaters. The day wore on and the shores flowed by. The tribesmen ate of their food and drank of the water. When afternoon came, the banks fell away and the current slackened. The shores became indefinite. The river merged itself into a vast swamp from which came a continual muttering. The water seemed to grow dark when black mud took the place of the clay that had formed its bed. Then there appeared floating green things which did not move with the flowing water. They were the leaves of the water lilies that managed to survive along with cabbages and very few other plants in the midst of a fungus world. Twelve feet across, any one of the green leaves might have supported the whole of Burl's tribe. They became so numerous that only a relatively narrow, uncovered stream flowed between tens of acres of the flat, floating leaves. Here and there, colossal wax blossoms could be seen. Three men could hide in those enormous flowers. They exhaled an almost overpowering fragrance into the air. And presently, the muttering sound that had been heard far away grew in volume to an intermittent deep bass roar. It seemed to come from the banks on either side. It was the discordant croaking of frogs, eight feet in length, which lived and throve in this swamp. Presently, the tribesfolk saw them, green giants sitting immobile upon the banks, only opening their huge mouths to croak. Here in the swamps there was such luxuriance of insect life that a normal tribal hunting ground, in which tribesmen were not yet accustomed to hunt, would seem like a desert by comparison. Myriads of little midges, no longer than three or four inches across their wings, danced above the water. Butterflies flew low, seemingly, and amored of their reflection in the glassy water. The people watched as if their eyes would become engorged by the strange new things they saw. Where the river split and split and divided again, there was nothing with which they were familiar. Mushrooms did not grow here. Moles, yes. But there were cattails with stalks like trees, towering thirty feet above the waterways. After a long, long time, though, the streams began to rejoin each other. Then low hills loomed through the thicker haze that filled the air here. The river flowed toward and through them. And here a wall of high mountains rose toward the sky, but their height could not be guessed. They vanished in the midst even before the cloud bank swallowed them. The river flowed through a river gate, a water gap in the mountains. While day still held fully bright, the bobbing rafts went whirling through a narrow pass with sheer walls that rose beyond all seeing in the mist. Here there was even some white water. Above it, spanning a chasm of five hundred feet across, a banded spider had flung its web. The rafts floated close enough to see the spider, a monster even of its kind. Its belly swollen to a diameter of yards. It hung motionless in the center of the snare as the humans swept beneath it. Then the mountains drew back, and the tribe was in a valley where, look as they might, there was no single tawny red puffball from whose spreading range the tribesmen were refugees. The rafts grounded, and they waded ashore, while still the day held. 
and there was food here in plenty. But darkness fell before they could explore. As a matter of precaution, Burl and his folk found a hiding place in a mushroom thicket and hid until morning. The night sounds were wholly familiar to them. The noise of katydids was louder than usual. The feminine sound of that name gives no hint of the sonorous, deep-toned notes the enlarged creature uttered, and that implied more vegetation as compared with straight fungoid flora. A great many fireflies glowed in the darkness, shrouding the hiding place, indicating that huge snails they fed on were plentiful. The snails would make very suitable prey for the tribesmen also. But men were not yet established in their own minds as predators. They were, though, definitely no longer the furtive vermin they had been. They knew there were such things as weapons. They had killed ants for food, and a pirate wasp as an exercise in courage. To some degree, they were acquiring Burl's own qualities. But they were still behind him, and he still had some way to go. The next day, they explored their new territory with a boldness which would have been unthinkable a few weeks before. The new haven was a valley, spreading out to a second swamp at its lower end. They could not know it, but beyond the swamp lay the sea. Exploring, because of strictly practical purposes and not for the sake of knowledge, they found a great trap door in the earth, sure sign of the lair of a spider. Burl considered that before many days the monster would have to be dealt with, but he did not yet know how it could be done. His people were rapidly becoming a tribe of men, but they still needed Burl to think for them. What he could not think of so far could not be done. But a part of the proof that they needed Burl to think for them lay in the fact that they did not realize it. They gathered facts about their environment. The nearest ant city was miles away. That meant that they would encounter its scouting foragers rather than working parties. The ant city would be a source of small prey, a notion that would have been inconceivable a little while ago. There were numerous giant cabbages in the valley, and that meant that there were big, defenseless slugs to spear whenever necessary. They saw praying mantises, the adults, were eighteen feet tall and as big as giraffes, but much less desirable neighbors, and they knew that they would have to be avoided. But there were edible mushrooms on every hand. If one avoided spiders and praying mantises and the meat-eating beetles, if one were safely hidden at night against the amorous male spiders who took time off from courtship, to devour any living creature that came their way, and if one lived at high-tension alertness, interpreting every sound as possible danger and every unknown thing as certain peril, then one could live quite comfortably in this valley. For three days the tribesmen felt that they had found a sort of paradise. John had his belly full to bursting all day long. Tet and Dick became skilled ant hunters. Dora found a better spear and practiced thoughtfully with it. There were no red puffballs here. There was food. Burl's folk could imagine no greater happiness. Even old Tama scolded only rarely. They surely could not conceive of any place where a man might walk calmly about with no danger at all of being devoured. This was paradise and it was a deplorable state of affairs. It is not good for human beings to feel secure and experience contentment. Men achieve only by their wants or through their fears. Back at their former foraging ground, the tribe would never have emulated Burl with any passion so long as they could survive by traditional behavior. Before the menace of the red puffballs developed, he had brought them to the point of killing ants, with him present and ready to assist. They would have stayed at about that level. The red dust had forced their flight. 
During that flight, they had achieved what was, compared to their former timidity, prodigies of valor. But now they arrived at paradise. There was food. They could survive here in the fashion of the good old days, before they had learned the courage of desperation. They did not need Burl to keep them alive or to feed them. They tended to disregard him. But they did not disperse. Social grouping is an instinct in human beings, as it is in cattle or in schools of fish. Also, when Burl was available, there was a sense of pleasant confidence. He had gotten them out of trouble before. If more trouble came, he would get them out of it again. But why look for trouble? Burl's tribesmen sank back into a contented lethargy. They found food and hid themselves until it was all consumed. A part of the valley was found where they were far enough from visible dangers to feel blissfully safe. When they did move, though still with elaborate caution, it was only to forage for food. And they did not need to go far, because there was plenty of food. They slipped back, happier than they had ever been. The foragers finally began to forget to take their new spears or clubs with them. They were furtive vermin in a particularly favorable environment. And Burl was infuriated. He had known adulation. He was cherished, to be sure. But adulation no longer came his way. Even Saya. And ironically, natural change took place in Saya. When Burl was a chieftain, she looked at him with worshipful eyes. Now that he was as other men, she displayed coquetry, and Burl was of that peculiarly direct-thinking sort of human being who is capable of leadership but not of intrigue. He was vain, of course, but he could not engage in elaborate maneuvers to build up a romantic situation. When Saya archly remained with the women of the tribe, he considered that she avoided him. When she coyly avoided speech with him, he angrily believed that she did not want his company. End of chapter 8, part 1